Hello and welcome to The End of the Chain. I'm Samuel McCullough, host of this podcast. And I want to welcome you to this episode where I have Dan Elitzer come on to chat about all things blockchain and Ethereum and some of the ideas that he's been running with like super liquidity. I hope you guys have been enjoying this podcast. This was actually a great chat that we had. And uh, make sure you hit that like and also uh, keep safe in these in these tough times. The markets are awash with volatility and it's it's really difficult out there both for families and for everybody else. So I hope that everyone is keeping safe and just just you know making sure that they appreciate the times that we have. All right, that's gonna wrap it up for me. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and uh, let's hop in. I wanted to start this conversation by, I guess, addressing something that we've been seeing with the, with the, growth, the growth of DeFi, right? Which is this kind of increasing leverage of platform and apps being built on each other, right? So you have Maker, which is then used in Compound, which is then used in BZX, which is then used in a whole host of other programs, right? And so you start to see a uh, multiple derivatives of single products uh, being built out, right? And the, the 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 safety and the security of those products is really tied to the underlying apps or products that they're using. Um, one of the things that I've kind of been wondering is 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 this actually fluidity between apps when it comes to Ethereum, or is it just a, a an increase in I guess fragility of the entire system. I mean, that's probably a good place to start. That's that's a great question. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that you know it's it's in some ways it's both, right? Um, mm-hmm. There was actually uh, um, I think this this piece that I wrote about a year ago on superfluid collateral, which was hypothesizing we were going to start to see a lot more interaction between these protocols and assets specifically flowing through. Uh, multiple protocols um, and and the idea of C tokens before there were C tokens from Compound. Um, I, I think, you know, we've seen that largely play out and that is what we've all been referring to as these money Legos. But at the same time, it is a weakness, right? There are a lot of dependencies and those dependencies can be scary, especially when pretty much every major smart contract has had some flaw in it, right? Sam Sam Sun, uh, the security researcher, has just been crushing contract after contract. And so uh, do I think these things are safe yet for the general public? Most of them probably not, maybe, maybe none of them really to go widespread yet. Um, mm-hmm. And certainly once you start compounding that risk together, uh, it's in a place where we really need to harden this. And I, I think actually, although he's more popular in, in the Bitcoin circles than the Ethereum circles, um, we really need to think about Nick Zabo um, wrote a great piece talking about fiduciary code. And mm-hmm. so the approach to how we're, we're building these contracts, how we're designing them needs to be different from normal software, right? This is more akin to designing uh, something is hardware really in terms of the the difficulty in modifying it after it's been set in stone. Um, you know, there are ways to upgrade contracts certainly, but th- there's both the extra care and design up front, but also just thinking through and really running so many tests. Like this is, this is like the nuclear power plant type yeah. situation where you really need to be sure you've got it right. Uh, this is not just people's money. Cause I think, you know, people, think about that. It's like, oh, I don't want to lose somebody else's money. But but really, if we're successful, this is the whole financial system, right? So it's not just about users who may have independently chosen to deposit funds into your contract. If we're trying to build a new financial system and you are building a critical piece of that infrastructure and you're successful, then a failure in your code could bring down the whole system. So we really just need to be applying a, a extremely high bar in terms of how carefully we're auditing these things and how closely we're looking at the interactions. 
I mean, but is it a weakness in the coding language when you're not using something that's um, f- like formally uh, complete at the end? Yeah, potentially, right? And that's that's the case for um, something like like Tezos, which is really you know focused on on that. I know there have been attempts to formally verify stuff for um, for Ethereum as well. Uh, there's fo- folks like Runtime Verification, I think, are doing some good good work on this front. Uh, but mm-hmm. a formal verification is is both hard and it's not just a um, it's not going to just be a catch all. Um, yeah. But certainly, it's it's a it's a step in the right direction, and I think we will likely get to a place where, if you're dealing with a meaningful amount of money, uh, people should be looking for some some type of of uh, formal verification on the contracts. I mean, but or could that just be added into Ethereum some way in some sort of uh, like? So I'm I'm not I'm not an engineer I'm not I'm so I, right. I, I don't want to want to say for sure but but yeah I mean my understanding is yes people have been working on formal verification mm-hmm. for Ethereum for Solidity um, I don't know what that looks like with the transition to ETH two and and EWASM and uh, how yeah. that makes things more difficult or, or easier uh, but yes I my understanding is it is possible I mean but so we are moving towards I guess a super fluid uh, protocols right. Bitcoin's coming over to Ethereum this year. We trust BTC or Ren. Um, you're going to see other ports of like Ripple with uh, with Kava and their and their cross chain CDPs. Um, is, is this an is this an argument for I, I, I guess a good multi chain environment, or I, I or is this a, a I guess monopolistic uh, endpoint that will go? Is that the a chain like Ethereum? which provides the, the most, uh, I guess, applications to be used will just can will suck liquidity away from, from other, uh, blockchains. That that's a great question. I think, um, to the, ex- to a certain extent, it depends on how quickly we're transitioning from, uh, some of the infrastructure phase to more of an application phase. And, it, and it's not just, you go from infrastructure to application. I think, uh, there's some great, there's a great piece by, I think some folks at USB, Danny Grant and Nick Grossman talking about how it's like a cycle between infrastructure and application build out. Uh, but if you look at, you know, the top 10, top 20 on coin market cap today, almost all of that, or, or I'm sorry, which I, I like their representation, uh, better in terms of, uh, looking at the, the actual like liquid market cap, but most of those top coins are coins for layer one chains. They're not ERC-20 tokens. There are a few in there like, you know, Binance and some others, but uh, largely it's independent chains. And so Mm -hmm. as long as that is true, there's a real need to do some of these cross chain protocols and get DeFi done in ways where you can go cross chain, whether that is using things like TBTC or or REN to, to pull in Bitcoin onto Ethereum or you know you mentioned Kava, and I think a lot of interesting stuff is happening in the, in the Cosmos ecosystem right now. We're seeing a, a lot of people start to do things in Cosmos zones, and and that's really around being able to go across these chains. If uh, we do get to a place, though, I think where uh, Ethereum or some other chain becomes the dominant one, I think Ethereum is very firmly in the driver's seat right now for building out applications. Um, Eventually, we're going to reach the point where as these tokens related to applications built on top of Ethereum become increasingly valuable, we should see that consolidate more on Ethereum. And I think at that point, cross-chain interactions become less important, yeah. right? If, not, if, if these other platforms are not getting a sufficient ecosystem, um, why are they there? It's, they become effectively meme coins where they're trying to compete to be money but it's going to be really, really hard if all the activity is happening on Ethereum. And I do think Bitcoin is a, is a bit of a separate case because that is meant to like purely be money. Uh, and that's great. The other smart contract platforms, they're trying to back into a monetary premium through usage for smart contracts. And that seems really hard when you don't have any real activity happening. I mean, but why is there a, why is there a subcase for... Bitcoin, when you know, uh, if if there's no other use for all of these other, I mean, if, if there's no other use for these other coins as as 
I guess it's called a money or an, I guess a better term well, so would be the, use in an application layer, right? Yeah. Um, so I think because those things are the, you know, if you look at, you know, Tezos or EOS or any of these other things like that, right. They're, they're out there and they're, they're saying like, look, you use our platform to build out applications. And then there's the assumption that if you do that, then value will accrue to these tokens. I think it, for a lot of them, it's hard to say, yes, there will be a ton of value that will accrue there unless some sort of monetary premium develops, which I think their hypothesis is this starts off being used as kind of a medium of exchange to pay for applications running on the platform and then evolves into being a, um, a you know, store of value from there. I think that's a, a hard transition to make and it, and it, even the possibility is predicated on getting a lot of initial usage. Whereas yeah. Bitcoin started off with more of the, the store of value approach. And I think it's different in that the, the power of money is really around people's belief in it, right? We're not using, um, a, a given platform just cause it's, it's the best, right? Bitcoin doesn't have the highest market cap because it is technically the most superior, right? You can fork Bitcoin and put in like one upgrade and be like, look, it's superior to Bitcoin. But we've seen time and again, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. Um, it's not just being technologically superior. It's about people's belief in essentially the social contract around that particular uh, asset. And that's something that is really hard to, to overcome. And I think there is a special place for Bitcoin as a result of that. And also there's, there's a good case to be made. And I think, you know, Andreas Antonopoulos made a, a good case for this years ago around um, trying to be as, as thin of a protocol as possible. Um, and so Bitcoin is the ultimate kind of thin protocol for money. It's just trying to be money and not trying to do a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that there's room for that being very differentiated. Uh, and it is obviously like the leader. And we may think that Ethereum and Bitcoin get talked about, you know, relatively equally in, on crypto Twitter and such like that. But if you look out globally, you know, uh, Bitcoin is just leaps and bounds ahead of Ethereum. And if people are looking for this as a non-sovereign store of value, the obvious place they're going to go first is, is Bitcoin. And I'm hopeful that we can build a lot of cool applications and useful applications on Ethereum to start to pull a significant portion of those people over to use those applications as well. But I, I don't think that that's necessarily a foregone conclusion. Yeah. I, you know, my I guess my argument for if I had to be an ETH maximalist, which I'm not, is that you know, Ethereum was the first to create dollars out of something extremely volatile. And, you know, as a, as a dollar maximalist, I guess you could say, I love dollars. You can, you can yeah. give me all the dollars you want. Uh, as a dollar maximalist, I think that's a lot more powerful than just a store value. Or maybe it's, it's different, but uh, it, has, it has different purposes, right? Absolutely. Uh, because when you, look at, when you look at commercial banking, it's not about it, we're, we're not talking about stores of value and and um, you know typically the things that the uh, I guess Bitcoin money people talk about. Uh, you're looking at payment flows and uh, money being used for commercial purposes. And I th I don't think any cryptocurrency will be able to ever solve those um, th those issues right in in being able to move like billions of dollars across. Uh, continents, you know, it can do that with Bitcoin, but there's too much volatility in the asset, right? And so the ability to have a, a stable asset, in this case, uh, DAI uh, or some other stable coin, uh, is leaps and bounds beyond, uh, it, it's just better than having a, a, a regular cryptocurrency, right? Uh, well, wait, so is it backing? Yeah, I mean, that, that's interesting, right? And how it's created, but I, I mean, I, I, I find much more interest in, in these, these uh, trustless stable assets uh, rather than the, the layer ones themselves. Yeah, I think I think there is there there certainly is a lot of use to things like die and, and having this uh, stable asset, but it, it does introduce a lot of additional risk right on top of the risk for 
uh, ETH and Ethereum, right? Mm-hmm. You're also then layering on additional risk around the maker contracts and governance around that. And, yeah. you know, it stood up pretty well so far, but, you know, there was a known vulnerability for a while where this like governance could be attacked and all the funds could be stolen. And was it unlikely? Sure. But it was there and it was only after uh, the recent kind of flash loan activity made very clear that that was not a good assumption that this would remain out of reach of somebody who just wanted to come in and take a bunch of money, that that was changed. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, we do know that that it's not riskless. Um, and there's also ways that you can get to stable value using something similar like Bitcoin, right? We've seen Abra do this for years um, with allowing essentially they're creating like synthetic dollars um, backed with Bitcoin. And so you can get there. The question is, do you want to have all of the logic and everything handled on chain or can you do it off chain? Um, we've got a, a portfolio company uh, called Value that operates in Latin America. And one of their kind of initial markets they've, they've gone into has been uh, Venezuela and doing remittances into Venezuela. Um, largely being sent from Colombia. And so what they're doing for there is they're able to do remittances using local Bitcoins on the back end. Uh, and so the person sending the money is sending Colombian pesos. The person receiving money is receiving Venezuelan bolivars. They don't even realize that Bitcoin is being used in between. But because Bitcoin is so liquid in both Colombia and Venezuela, this has become the cheapest, easiest way to do remittances from Colombia to Venezuela. And the team building this are not Bitcoin maximalists. They're not even like crypto native right. people themselves, right? They came to this because they were like, they were trying to solve this problem. And they said, we'd like to use maybe dollars, but then they found, you know, dollars obviously with the, you know, legacy banking system, that's the problem why it's so expensive to get money into Venezuela. And they said, look, this is a great tool. The Bitcoin is the most liquid asset uh, that we can, crypto asset that we can have in the, access to in these markets. So it lets us get get this solution that we need to people who need it, uh, and they're not being um, religious about what they're using. So I think right. you can find uses. Liquidity in some cases may actually be more important than long term price stability when you're talking about just flows of money. Right? Yes, I, I agree with you completely. I, this is my like liquidity maximalism rather than yes, than absolutely. Yeah, I think that's because, that's how I would classify myself as well. It's like liquidity maximalism. That's that's what we need to do is we need to like get much, much more activity happening in crypto relative to on legacy rails. And mm-hmm. and like who wins kind of who we're, we're all gonna win if we can move things over into this new system, which I think has just amazing properties that are gonna make it better for pretty much everybody in the world. Right. So if, if the if the long term use case for Bitcoin is on the Lightning Network, right, that opens up loads of, of micropayment options uh, that never existed before. But those micropayment options will be uh, useless unless they have like liquid uh, exchange rails to be able to go into dollars. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, without that, it's just it's it's useless. Right. So building these these extremely liquid, extremely fast rails to go from, like you said, Colombian dollars to uh, Bitcoin and then back again. Or what, it doesn't really matter what it is. It could be Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else. I think it's much more, uh, it's much more important and much more, and, and provides a lot more value in the long term, right? Yeah. Although I think like any, you know, payment system, it, it really shines once you can get people in and, and keep them in. Um, mm-hmm. And so then that might be the case for for what you were mentioning in terms of like wanting to have people in US dollar denominated assets uh, that are kind of crypto native, but US dollar denominated. Uh, I think the the view, I think, pro- which is probably more prevalent uh, in the in the Bitcoin community than the Ethereum community is like, eventually, BTC is going to be more stable than the dollar. Uh, or and, and I, I believe you that. Know, I, I believe that yeah, I, I, I think... Um, it depends how things play out, but I, I've got to say, I, I came into crypto, I came into Bitcoin specifically, looking at it as this open source payment rails and really not mm-hmm. uh, feeling any resonance with the kind of end the Fed, money without government uh, viewpoint. That said, being in this space and seeing how things have evolved over the last uh, you know seven seven years or so, 
I I can't help but be very concerned looking at our monetary policy and just wondering, you know, at what point do we end up hitting hyperinflation? And then while the dollar may not be as swingy on a day-to-day basis, uh, if it's only going in one direction, people may start migrating to something that uh, at least has a possibility of going in the other direction. And if enough people get there, then it, it starts to become relatively price stable. Now, I think that's a somewhat of a low likelihood event in terms of um, you know Bitcoin or ETH or anything like that getting to that place of mm-hmm. people seeing it as more of a safe haven than the dollar. Uh, but I, I I don't think it's as low of a chance as the majority of the world must think in order for you know BTC and ETH to be priced where they are today. Right. Right. So. I guess how does how does that or well actually before I jump there, so what you're saying is that, and I I kind of believe this as well too is that there's there's a clear path to accepting cryptocurrencies without becoming involved in the religion that's typically associated with this kind of cyberpunk libertarianism, you know, mm-hmm. uh, over over my dead crypto sort of. <laughs> sort of feelings that get uh, spread on crypto Twitter, but may not be indicative of the, uh, I guess, greater community at large uh, and the companies that are actually using it. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there, there's absolute opportunity there. And, and I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. Like I, I'm a huge bull on, on, on crypto, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it, there's still a well, lot of open questions. <laughs> Right. But, you know, like I look at more, I, I have my own issues, right? So I, I worked in uh, as a signals intelligence analyst in my younger years um, in, from 2003 to 2008. And uh, I was in the Marines and we worked hand in hand with the NSA to work through metadata and like find people and then send special forces guys to kick down doors and, and you know, arrest or, you know, put them somewhere else. Right, and so I've I've been keenly aware of of the potential use cases when applying that to crypto, and um, I I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm that that was that was my initial kind of reason for getting into all this. Right, is that I I I came and I saw like a, a ledger that could be you know, publicly sourced and analyzed by anyone. Um, and you know, that's pretty cool, but at the same time, I think it's open to a lot of, uh, abuse as, as well. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think that's, that's probably a, a, a sign of just where we are in, in development of this technology. I, mm-hmm. I don't believe that we'll be doing huge amounts of transactions in a way that is anywhere close to as transparent as it is today. Yeah. Right. We're, we're already starting to see things like. Uh, Tornado Cash and, and Aztec um, on Ethereum. Uh, and we've had Zcash for a number of years. Grin, I actually, I've got a lot of questions about how private that actually will be in practice. But um, yeah. you know, some, some of the stuff that's more, you know, really zero knowledge proof based, um, I, I think is uh, seems seems really strong. There's a lot of questions about how we get to broader adoption, but I I don't think it's responsible to try and to get you know a billion people onto ethereum a we can't handle like scaling wise but b even if we could the amount of financial transparency that creates in, in the public domain is is just really really dangerous and right. so i think we we really need much stronger privacy solutions not not for people doing nefarious things right you I know mean, people do nefarious things for the dollar or whatever um they do nefarious things with the internet we're not going to like shut down the internet right but i think uh just as a matter of but, course, the same way you encrypt your your communication with a website, you're going to need to encrypt your your financial transactions, and they they need to be private between the two parties participating in them. Right, but when you look at, I, I mean, my I guess my overall crypto question for crypto in 2020 is: Can it break the the survey? I guess it, the, the term is surveillance capitalism, right? So can right. it can it break the business models of the incumbents, which are Google and Facebook and uh, pretty much any other tech company that's yeah. collecting and analyzing data at a large scale. 
so that they can, you know, either understand their customers better or, um, you know, sell them more ads because the, yeah. the, the user, it, like the, the users are not the, uh, customer, right? They're the commodity that's turned into the product, which is then sold off to other people who then use it, right? Yeah. So, so I guess my, my question there would be, what do you mean by um, that? That this is going to like prove that we can kind of like upend that that business model? Because I'm, I, I think it's pretty unlikely that that we'll get there in in 2020. But uh, but mm -hmm. in, generally, just well, in the, in the 2020s, in the in the next decade, okay, right? the next decade. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, in the next decade, uh, yeah, hopefully we will see uh points towards different uh business models um that said i think we often are too quick to throw out some of the good aspects of the ad-based business model right i think surveillance capitalism as a whole like yes we are being massively overly tracked and, and it it's, makes me deeply deeply uncomfortable at the same time the the general idea of using advertising as a way for people to not have to explicitly make a financial payment. They're making this kind of implicit mm -hmm. payment with their with their time and with their attention. That's been a huge equalizing force and that's allowed businesses to grow and like Google's able to offer services to anyone with an internet connection without requiring them to you know swipe a credit card or scan a QR code and send a payment uh, because of advertising. And I think that we as as um you know, a, a global culture are way better off because of ad-based models. Now, do I think they've gone too far? Sure. But I, I think that I'm also scared to enter into a world where um, the default assumption is you need to pay for, like, explicitly send a payment for every little action you take online. Right. But this would be enabled by, this could be enabled by, uh, like, layer two Bitcoin, right? Well, sure, but even if you're enabling things by layer two Bitcoin, I, I don't want to be sending like my, a whole sats. Yeah, I don't. But I don't. I don't uh, I'm I'm really. But look, you're you're so comments. so Google Google takes your Google takes all of your communications, mm -hmm. and and then parses them, and then breaks them up and analyzes them through throws them through a bunch of algorithms, uh, and then uh, you know comes back with I, I, new and better ways to. I, like sell products to you or mm -hmm. deliver new information to you, right? And so you and your data is not actually that, like it's, it doesn't really matter to, uh, I mean, it matters to them because they, they want to extract value out of it, right? And their ideas of, of privacy and anonymity uh, are, are just non-existent, right? They don't care about protecting you or uh, your anonymity. They care more about extracting data from you. And, and building more metadata points so that they can build better products to sell to other people. Well, right. so, I, so I would, I would, so I wouldn't, agree, I actually wouldn't agree with that. Right. So I, I, I guess there's a question of what do individuals care about versus what does the company care about? But I know right. a number of individuals who are like on the trust and safety team at Google and they care very deeply about this. And I think there's, there is an incentive problem, but uh, for the company as a whole, but, I, but I don't think that Google inherently is about, extracting value from you to sell to other people like this is just this is how the business model works where the revenue flow is coming from but mm -hmm. if they're not providing value to you and me for our information like we're not gonna we're not gonna be there we're not gonna give it to them so we are um we are being compensated with these services that we're not otherwise paying for now whether that that split in terms of where the value is accruing is fair or, you know, are there ways that they could do this and deliver the value while being, uh, giving us more control on, and, and us as users being more cognizant of what we are giving up? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of room to move in a better direction, but I, I'm not convinced that the, the model is inherently broken of mm -hmm. giving services to users who don't pay for them, having those the cost of delivering those services and developing those services be subsidized by ad advertisers. I'm not convinced that's broken. I've seen a couple companies in a crypto space try to do things in which doesn't even necessarily inherently have to be crypto based, but like doing analysis locally on your phone to serve the ads, keeping that data locally. Um, I think that uh, some of the stuff that the decentralized identity community has been working on around that 
has a lot of potential. I still think it's, I've got some questions about how it actually is going to end up working in practice, but, but yeah. you can get, you can keep that same overall business model while I believe stripping out some of the surveillance elements of it by allowing users to kind of keep their own data and still have the ads presented to them based on that data without it getting out of their control. So th there is a possibility of, of Web3 succeeding then where yeah, you, yeah, you, I think, you own your yes. identity and not, not own your data, but you have, I guess, greater control over, over what's given out. Yes. And, and I think the caveat there is um, that's going to take more moon math. Right, we need, we need yeah. better, <laughs> like, you know, secure multi-party computation. Better things that that can be done, um, because mm -hmm. a lot of times when I hear people talking about like, oh, well, I'll just you know store the data locally, and then I'll get permission to this app to access specific pieces of the data. It's like, well, yeah, they get access to a specific piece of that data, but then like, are you making? Are are you able to verify? Are we being very extra careful? They are not then extracting that data and keeping a copy of it, right? The kind of the nice thing in some ways about the Google and Facebook model is that like they become our default data guardians. And while they've certainly gotten, they've overextended what they're willing to share and they've gotten slapped, like generally speaking, they don't want to, they've got incentive not to overly expose that to other people who can then take that data and not need Google and Facebook anymore. Like they, they kind of act as a bit of a shield between us and the, all those advertisers who want the data. Um, but is it, is it time? I mean, like on, on a more political thing, I mean, do you think it'd be time at this point for like Google and Facebook? I'm just going to use the, them two as an example, right? Because they're the largest and pretty much everybody uses Google. There's no way to really disconnect yourself from, from using Google on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you think it's time to, um, democratize them in some way where there's a uh i guess an oversight panel inside the company that's that's democratically democratically elected and yeah. has and has i yeah. guess decision making powers instead I of mean, instead of a, a you know a few you know how much how much how much control do does uh larry and sergey have right in yeah the overall well, there's certainly a lot of questions around the, the overall governance there mm -hmm. um I, I'm not convinced that moving to a democratic process next necessarily fixes that. And I'm a little uncomfortable with what it would, would imply. I, I think that, yes, we do need to fix some of the, the types of activities that we're seeing from big tech companies like, like Google and Facebook, but that's, that's not where I think, we're going to be making the most headway with, with crypto, um, mm -hmm. over, over the next few years. Uh, I think that's, that's something that, that can come along, uh, and hopefully will come along later. But I, I do think that these purely financial use cases are the, the tip of the spear. And if we can't get, uh, digital money, uh, specifically like, you know, crypto, uh, so assets that are not, issued or controlled by any centralized authority, if we can't get those out there um, to, you know, orders of magnitude more people than are touching them today, yeah. then we don't really even have a chance on some of the more web three type things. Yeah. I mean, digital identity really makes, is, is interesting for me, right? Um, I've, I've been a keen follower of a few projects for the past few years and uh, I, I think it's something that, again, like you said, Moon Math needs to come in and, and help shape it out uh, to see if it's even possible, right? Uh, but the idea of it is great. Yeah, that, the actual implementation, I'm not so sure of. Um, but yeah, we'll exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I love the idea. I do think there's I have some, some questions about some of the theory, but like really the bigger questions around implementation and how you're actually going to go to market. Yeah, I think that's that's a problem that not just in identity, but across the space we often see is you know teams that get really enamored with the technical and philosophical aspects of their solutions, and they forget to talk to users and understand uh, 
really the needs of uh, of who they're who they're trying to serve. Um, mm-hmm. Talking to those users, getting that feedback, and then ultimately being able to develop the right strategy to bring it to market. Yes, right. I think there's often the assumption that if you build it, they will come, and we, we know that is not true. Um, in in some very very special specific cases, that has somewhat been true, but you really need to have a go to market strategy. You can't just ship something cool and then hope everyone will realize it's cool and start using it. I guess this kind of ties into what you're doing as a portfolio company. You know, like how would you say that you like position yourself with the companies that you're working with and and what sort of operational support are you giving them on a I I I guess day-to-day basis? Yeah, great question. So I mean so IDEO Collab Ventures, we we really do try to make sure that we help our portfolio companies stay focused on their users and that they're uh, they're interacting with them on a regular basis. The the way that we enable that can vary pretty widely. Um, we, in some cases, are getting very deep and hands on uh, working with teams and and helping them uh, at the kind of interface level or some of the you know protocol design aspects, incentive mechanisms, storytelling. Um, other cases, it's more like um, coaching and pointing them towards great resources and great people who can can help them externally. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been doing startup studio programming, which is not just for our portfolio companies, but but for the broader ecosystem, where we do these full day and half day workshops to go really deep on like how do you talk to your users, how do you actually collect useful feedback, and then how do you synthesize that and translate it into the next iteration for your product or for your feature. Um, so it, it can it can take a lot of different forms, but I think the consistent thread through there is a belief that just uh, technical creativity and talent and execution is not enough. Uh, it, it hasn't been enough for years. And what we need now is folks really making sure that they're they're thinking from very, very early on, okay, let's say we do succeed in building this, like it is, um, you know, technically feasible to build this, we, that how are we going to then get it out there? Um, how are we going to get people using it and get the flywheel started turning? And we talked about being kind of liquidity maximalists, right, earlier. Yeah. And I think that's, that's an area where um, I think I, I tend to get super nerdy and and maybe get caught up in some of the, the crypto mechanics uh, more than than remembering to think about individual users and always and, and talk to them. But I think there's a lot of really cool liquidity hacking stuff that we're going to start to see emerging uh, mm-hmm. to help some of these DeFi protocols get that initial traction. And that's going to be part of their go-to-market strategy is, um, is largely made around bootstrapping initial liquidity uh, yes, you need you need, you need actual users there, uh, but a lot of these protocols, especially things that are um, using some form of automated market maker or algorithmic rate setting, you just need to get over a certain initial liquidity threshold in order to make these things usable. And I think we're going to start to see teams do some very creative stuff to get themselves past that like million dollar mark, five million dollar mark, ten million dollar mark, uh, so that their protocols are really useful uh, for a large number of people. Mm-hmm. I mean, did you, so w- one of the projects that you're working with is Handshake, which just launched. Yes. You guys, so they have a really interesting uh, token distribution model where what it's like 80% of all tokens are going to go f- in the form of developer grants. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they did, a, I think a, pretty unique thing. And that was one of the things that we got most excited about. Obviously that we really liked the team and Joseph and JJ and all of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that, that I, that view of this is supposed to be a a public good, a public resource, and therefore Mm -hmm. it can't be, um, you know, 20% owned by, by some venture fund. Um, we need to get it actually out into the hands of, um, the world generally, but also specifically like let's, we're, we're kind of literally printing money out of, out of thin air. Why not give a lot of it to the people who, if they don't buy into it, if they don't adopt it, this thing is never going to be meaningful anyway. 
Um, right. And so that willingness to say, look, this is not about making a quick buck. This is about giving a protocol that we believe in the greatest chance for success and spreading it widely. And, it, and if it succeeds, then even having a small sliver of that will be incredibly lucrative. Um, but y- y- I, I think their insight of not trying to optimize for percentage ownership, but really adoption uh, is something that I find incredibly inspiring and think that a lot more projects need to kind of look in that direction. I mean, did you guys have any hand in helping them shape their their um, their token structure, or was it more uh, on the like technical and not? Yeah, like so yeah, design? we so we worked with, we worked with the with them, um, uh, designed the logo, uh, developed the uh, user interface and onboarding flow for folks participating in that airdrop when there when there was mm-hmm. the UI for it um, for that period, uh, and we we did to get down to some technical details. I mean, like, well, you need to make sure you're supporting 24 word seed phrases because your raw private key format is not going to be supported by anybody. And we found mm-hmm. some issues with some of the PGP flow for the, for onboarding, uh, that they were able to fix. So we, we got pretty deep in there, but the idea of giving away like 80% ish of the supply that we, we had no hand in that, that was already baked when, when they first approached us. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, so what 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 is like the process for finding new companies to go into your portfolio? Because you know the the ones that you have so far are you know they're really good, respected companies. I mean, Masari is doing great stuff. Handshake is great. Uh, Zeppelin is pretty awesome. Uh, and same for the the rest. Yeah. So yeah, like, what, yeah. What what is the process of of doing all that? Great, great question. Uh, it's not a one size fits all thing, right? We don't have everybody fill out a form on our websites and then, you know, Mm -hmm. go through a a pure funnel. Um, A lot of the ones you mentioned, those were kind of relatively early companies in our portfolio based on uh, myself and other members of the team having been in this space for five, seven, eight years um, and just having a lot of relationships, knowing builders in the space. Um, Correct. Yeah. Where where are you based? Uh, Based in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. I was going to see if you were out there. Yep, yep. Uh, I think this there there really is a lot of activity happening here, and um, I think what one of the beauties of the space is really the ability to have a lot more distributed teams. Um, I think we're mm-hmm. even ahead of the broader tech community in that way. But uh, San Francisco, for all of its flaws, still is a pretty <laughs> amazing place, and <laughs> and really is an epicenter for a lot of activity in in, in tech generally and crypto specifically. Um, yeah. But you know, our process for for vetting companies is. Where we look through, we've got a, a pretty diverse team, right? Myself and um, Gavin McDermott on our team, we tend to um, gravitate a lot towards some of the the DeFi stuff. Um, we've got others on our team uh, who are are focused, uh, Tara Tan, Joe Gerber, Ian Lee, um, that are are focused on different aspects. Um, there's been uh, Tara's really a, one of the I think leading experts in Web three and what it's going to take to keep users in mind and onboard users into the Web3 ecosystem from Web2. Um, Joe has a product manager background and has, has worked with a lot of product teams over the years um, and really just brings a very, I think, uh, level of excellence uh, to looking at product that, that we don't see a lot in the crypto space. And Ian uh, used to work at City Ventures within Citibank and ran their uh, crypto and blockchain um, labs programs there. And he has both that background from those banks, but he's also been going super deep on the concept of cooperatives and uh, personal tokens and thinking about new organizational structures and the future of work. Um, so we all have a slightly different lens through which we're approaching this. And I think mm-hmm. that's something that is very different and that the teams that we work with appreciate is that we're coming in with a much broader diversity of backgrounds and a much wider lens on the possibilities in this space. and, and uh, tools from outside the crypto space. And that's one reason why I think uh, teams like working with us. Yeah. And <clears throat> so you, you guys have boots on the ground and then in their offices, or are you just uh, uh, having Skype calls and in Slack and stuff? Yes. Uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time uh, in Slack and Zoom and, and um, you know, a decent amount of traveling, although that seems like it's likely to be curtailed yeah. for the next little bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, our, 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 our core team is based out here in San Francisco. IDEO does have 
um, I believe nine offices globally. And, uh, you know, we, we do tap into our ideal colleagues um, to be resources to, to us and, and to portfolio companies where it's possible. Um, and we're, we're really um, looking over this next year to really take advantage of the fact that IDEO does have this global footprint and how can we connect both our portfolio companies to those other offices and how can those other offices um, mm-hmm. get involved in spotting some activity that's happening more locally uh, where they're based as well. Um, because we think that the reason that IDEO got involved with crypto and with blockchain technology back in 2015 was this belief that this was going to be a technology that had the potential to change the world. And if it was just left to uh, engineers and cryptographers, then this was not going to necessarily end up in the most positive way. And so we wanted to make sure that design was part of the conversation pretty early on so that we could help nudge the technology in ways that were considering humans and thinking about how people are likely to interact with these technologies rather than um, just looking at it from a purely technical or purely economic point of view. Right. Right. I mean, I, I wouldn't want JP Morgan to be in charge of designing the next, uh, the, the next money. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Nor, nor do we want, you know, yeah, nor do, do we want like, you know, even, even, you know, some random hacker just doing everything themselves. Right. And like, I think it is um, the, the Satoshi origin story for Bitcoin is pretty fantastic. And it's amazing that one individual or a small group of people like created something that is like literally changing the world, mm-hmm. but it's not just that one thing. There's this whole ecosystem that gets built up around it and that whole ecosystem needs to be built by people with diverse perspectives and skill sets. And uh, we, we want to try to avoid monoculture as much as possible. Right, right. And so so how does that go in when you're, I mean, because you have a pretty big, uh, I guess, I don't want to call it workforce, but group of people that are a part of IDEO Collabs, right? Yeah. So how, do, how does that go into to building the team then? Um, well, our, our team has been working together for, you know, about five years. Most of us have been here with that, that full time. Um, mm-hmm. so, uh, it ha- we haven't like gone out and, and pulled in new folks. It's more like we've been working together for years. We've yeah. developed this deep expertise together and just the way that we were constructed, we ended up, you know, having this fantastic range of, of, uh, skills, but we, we haven't gone out and intentionally added uh, additional folks to the team at, at this stage because I think we're just yeah. not ready to do that. But I think as we continue to learn and grow, uh, hopefully we'll be able to expand and start being uh, very intentional about what additional perspectives and um, uh, talents and skills we want to bring on to our core team. Yeah. <clears throat> do, you, do you see that there's any, I guess, substance difference between what's being developed inside, like in San Francisco versus uh, other small, I guess, tech communities outside of the United States? Like, is there an East versus West divide here uh, when it comes to, uh, I I guess, designing the next money of the future? Uh, And I mean, does that play into what you're doing at IDEO Labs? Well, I I think in in some ways, yes. And I think... um... Uh, I certainly wasn't the one to make this observation first, but I, I think it's accurate is that there there does tend to be a bit of an East Coast, West Coast split in the US within how crypto is viewed. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the East Coast view is very much that this is a financial technology um, and that there this is maybe a new form of money, a new asset class, and like looking at building up financial infrastructure around that. And then the West Coast view is more around crypto as this platform for permissionless innovation. Um, Mm. and so I think that, you know, it, as a result, I I would expect that I think there's probably a bit more, um, identification with some Bitcoin mindset, uh, within the kind of like East coast contingent and and a bit more Ethereum oriented on the West coast. But I think even within our team, we, we see, we've got people who lean more towards one direction than the other. And I, I think, you know, neither side is, is fully right. Um, it's not, it's not one or the other. It's really yeah. just a question of like, what's your primary versus secondary lens? Because I think at this at this point, most people who are kind of full time engaged in the space kind of at least see some value in in both of those perspectives. 
Right. I mean, I don't, I don't think either one is wrong. Again, I think right. that they both, they both go hand in hand to building, uh, you know, building better applications. Right. Is that, you know, like there's, there's a lot of Ethereum and uh, Ethereum ideas which are getting ported over to Bitcoin now. Right. So they're building uh, DeFi on RSK, and there's mo- that money on chain. I think is what it's called. The, um, yeah. Yes, I, I would, I would say that also RSK is. Um, I don't think most people in the Bitcoin community pay a lot of attention to it. I think it's it's certainly yeah. a it's it's a much smaller piece than when you'd look at like you know who's building applications on top of Ethereum um, versus like overall ETH holders. So, um, but yeah, I think some some of those ideas. But what I do think is actually interesting is the the narrative arc <laughs> um, tends to be that a lot of these things become narratives in Bitcoin and then six to 18 months later start to emerge as narratives in Ethereum. Um, and, and I think that's, that's been fascinating. I don't think Bitcoin should try to be Ethereum. And I understand in some cases, if there is a desire to capture some of the use cases that we are starting to see emerge on Ethereum. But, you know, if you look at things like the idea that like, you can't just scale on chain, you're going to need layer two scaling solutions. Like, yeah. Bitcoin had that for had that like kind of observation was widespread within the Bitcoin community before it was widespread in the Ethereum community. The idea that like you actually you want some level of a fee market um, was also you know widely accepted within the Bitcoin community before it was accepted in the, in the Ethereum community. Um, the idea of kind of being a store of value and having this monetary premium again um, started in the Bitcoin community. Ethereum community came around to it. I don't think it's like. I, th- I think everyone's learning from each other, and so that's that's great. Um, and I yeah. think it's actually one of the strengths of Ethereum has been the ability to uh, adopt narratives or even technical approaches that have been developed in other places. Um, one of the projects that we're invested in, I think, actually the only pre-launch um, generalized smart contract platform that we've we've invested in um, is Near, and. Uh, it's been really cool seeing some of the ETH2 roadmap come a lot closer to what Near is doing as a result of kind of Near developing stuff and Ethereum is starting to adopt it. And that's that's exciting for me, right? We've we've got exposure to both, so we have we obviously want to see both be successful. But um I think for a while the Ethereum developer community was a little insulated and, and just coming up trying to come up with ideas themselves. And I think this willingness to look out and start to pull in ideas and approaches from other ecosystems is a superpower. And if yeah. Ethereum is going to ultimately be, um, you know, orders of magnitude larger than it is today and, and be the dominant platform on which uh, smart contracts and, and uh, decentralized applications are deployed, then it's going to need to keep doing that and, and even accelerate the process on both the technical side and the narrative side. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's interesting to hear uh, because... I know that, like I've I've spoken to a lot of other protocols, uh, and over the past few years, and you know every time I speak to the the founders or builders or anything, it, it always kind of makes sense in what they're doing, and I'm I'm usually rooting for them. It's just maybe that path that they're going down just isn't the one that survives, right? Uh, you know, they are maybe they're building yeah. something that's 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 got great technology. It's just they they can't get. Uh, you know, like you said, those those liquid markets that that allows them to take the next step, or they can't get people to come and build on their on their platform. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's that's to me the number one thing. When looking at all these platforms, it's like, yeah, man, the tech is super cool, but like, are you ten x better? Like for people who really need it, that they're going to move over, because if not, it's. Like we already, we do have, we do have very functional smart contract platforms, uh, yeah. like, right. And so coming to market today, when, when I'm looking, when I'm evaluating projects, like the, yes, I love to geek out on the, on the tech piece, but when we're looking at making a decision, it's, well, do you have a differentiated way of getting to market that at least gives a plausible, um, possibility that you will be able to capture market share from Ethereum or, or, or from Bitcoin or, or from whoever. And there are very, very few teams who um, have something that, that I believe the market will find to be differ- differentiated versus, well, obviously this is technically superior and so people will, will need to move to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so Tezos, 
is deploying, I think, what, like 200 and something million dollars to, to train developers to uh, code on their platform. Uh, I mean, they're yeah. just there to, to like Ethereum already has a huge developer base, but yeah. Ethereum or Tezos is starting from nothing. You know, the only way that they can compete and try to catch up is just to chuck endless amounts of money until they until they have developer share. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, honestly, is not a terrible strategy. Right. It's I think as opposed to teams that have huge war chests and are not deploying that um, yeah. like it, it, it's at least they're they're saying like, OK, we've got this weapon in our arsenal. We're, we're going to use it. Um, and, and if they're willing to outspend all the other protocols that raised a ton of money and have these huge treasuries, then, you know, at least they're, they're using the resource to their advantage. Um, I have some skepticism as to whether that's going to be successful. Uh, we've certainly haven't seen a lot of teams succeed with that to date. Um, but, uh, at least it's a strategy. Yeah. And what about, what about the... I mean, do you see central? Do you think that the the growth of of crypto assets or just distributed assets will will centralize into you know you talked about East Coast West Coast, but we're really we're talking about New York and primarily San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that the the main development teams and the the projects that are going to succeed will kind of act, like congregate or aggregate in those in those cities and? Uh- yeah, good, good question. I mean, so actually, if you look at our portfolio today, I think the um, the majority of our portfolio, I believe, is now outside of San Francisco and New York. Um, mm-hmm. We do we do have a plurality of our investments are are San Francisco based, um, but I, I do think that there are excellent teams based in other cities or fully distributed. Um, I do think that there are very strong advantages to having uh, at least spending some time in San Francisco or New York, but especially San Francisco um, Mm -hmm. in terms of the connections with the other projects that are here, connections with investors, just it's so easy to just kind of live in the flow uh, of what's happening in the ecosystem out here. Um, And, and I do think that physical space is important for that. And that's one of the the things that I love about um, our office and the, and our ability to have like, both formal and informal residents come and spend time with us. Um, mm-hmm. it, the exchange of ideas just happens in ways that um, it, it's really hard to have happen virtually. Um, but I, I, I am I'm very bullish on both San Francisco and New York continuing to produce excellent teams that that go on to build world changing um, products and and companies and protocols, but. Uh, I do think there is an increasing ability for uh, the teams that are connected in the right ways through, um, you know, online communities to be able to spin up equally powerful things based anywhere in the world. Right. Because at some point, you won't be able to import any more workers into San Francisco. There's just no space to put them. Yeah, yeah. And we're now there's some propositions got passed to you know, limit office building, which has also <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. San Francisco is trying to find every way possible to advantage other cities. Right, but, but look at the, I, I mean, speaking for the United States, there's been some new smaller cities that have really popped up as tech hubs in the past you know, couple of years. You look at like Salt Lake City is is really becoming a dominant tech yeah, hub. Yeah, Salt Lake City is doing some great jobs. We're seeing some awesome stuff coming out of Denver, um, mm-hmm. you know, Austin gets talked about in, in, in some circles too. I think, you know, Boston, obviously, um, seeing some really cool stuff from there. Yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, there, there's, there's still nothing quite like San Francisco. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's why I'm out here. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I completely understand. I just, I just look at it from like a, uh, like a family planning thing, right? Is that, you're, you can't really, I mean, if you're moving to San Francisco, unless you're making yeah. $150,000 above, you know, what, how hard yeah. is it going to be for you to move into the property market, start a family and then, and then like stay for a long time. Right. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's the number one, like downside failure case, I think for, for the Bay area. Um, and you know, it's, I forget who it was, but there was, 
it was a pretty repeatable group that basically did this study that was saying that the lack of new housing being built in San Francisco, actually, you can you can measure the impact on overall like GDP for the U.S. because <laughs> we have such backwards land use policy uh, here in the area. <laughs> And, and that, yeah. that is just incredibly frustrating. And um, I, I wish that that we could find a way to turn this around. I'm, I'm actually surprised with all the, the very, um, very intelligent, very uh, resource heavy people that we have here who see this problem that we have not yet uh, seen a more concerted effort to fix this because I think it mm-hmm. can be a huge unlock uh, for, for the US and for the world, really. Um, because I do think there is so much power around these still physical hubs, and we need to stop limiting that um, for the good of the world. Right. I mean, you look at like China, right? China, if they needed a, a tech city, could build it in two years and right. have all of the living space, all of the office space they would ever need. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's, 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 there are pros and cons. Like, I don't want to pretend that, like, you know, if we just, immediately built like no restrictions on land use and, and immediately like let anybody build anything that that wouldn't have downsides. Um, it, it, it would, but, uh, I think we are way, way, way too far towards, um, uh, default. No than default. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's and a that, big argument that that's the crypto argument too, right? That's the crypto yeah. argument, right? Versus the kind of legacy real system, right? It's like, like, Crypto lets you have default yes rather than 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 default no. Permissionless systems are are powerful. Um, they they're dangerous. There's there's some downsides, but like there's something incredibly powerful about default. Do whatever you want, and we'll figure out how to address or rein it in afterwards if it, t- if it turns out not to be good. Mm-hmm. Because it's it's in it's in kind of chaotic permissionless systems that that real value is able to aggregate. Yeah. The you know, even if you look at it on like a broader city scale, the cities that were designed rather than organically grown function a lot better. They have le- they have less traffic problems even nowadays with cars. Uh, they they they're more livable. The uh, just general, um, I guess, uh, lifestyle there is better rather than these than government planned cities that end up looking like squares or something that was designed on a just a map thrown yeah. out there and yeah. some pretty lines drawn. Absolutely. I mean, physical space and architecture and city design are, are so important. Right. And, and just mm-hmm. looking at things from a purely, um, you know, kind of numbers based pure optimization standpoint, like you're never going to get the same kind of vibrancy and creativity. Um, and, and, and so that's, you know, an, another place where we, we just, in, in everything, I think the importance of having um, diversity perspectives is is important. Yeah, yeah. So, which which of your companies are? Do you have another one coming soon that you'll be adding to Ideo Labs? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we've we've got a couple of, of investments we've made recently that are not yet announced um, and that we're we're very excited about. Uh, I think you know we had a whole slew of announcements come out. Um, I think the week or two before ETH Denver, and and those weren't necessarily ones that we just made. You know, the, there's mm-hmm. always has to be a lag time, and they just happened to all announce during the same week. Um, but uh, we are we are pretty active. We've got over 20 companies in our portfolio at this stage. Um, we're we're actively looking for for more um, you know special early stage teams um, to invest in and work with. Um, I I can say we've got you know something that we're a couple of things actually we're very excited about in the DeFi space that that should be coming to market in the next month or so, um, and uh, there's there's also a lot of a lot of heat in in some other areas around um, personal tokens, social money. Um, I still think there's a lot of you know more hard financial infrastructure that that needs to get built out, um, but uh, o- overall, yes, we've we've got a number of things coming to market soon. I wish I could talk about them, um, but I, yeah, I, I can't do that at this point. Yeah, it's okay. I'm sure we'll be talking about them once they come to market. Exactly. Yeah, I think I think uh, a couple of these things are going to be getting uh, a lot of attention, so I'm, I'm excited to see uh, see them go live. Awesome. 
Well, I think that's uh, going to bring us to the end. Dan, I want to thank you for uh, coming on the episode. It was great. Thanks so much for having me, Sam. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning into that episode with Dan. Uh, I hope you guys liked it. You know, it's been really difficult in these times. I hope that you're spending time with your family and just making sure that uh, during you know, these market downturns and the coronavirus, just staying safe and uh, just making sure that you get through it. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in. You're the ones who make uh, this episode and uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative. You know, we're really building something here at the end of the chain uh, and I'm, I'm really thankful for you guys. As with everything, nothing on this, on this podcast should be taken for financial advice. And uh, yeah, I will see you guys in the next episode. We got some cool ones coming up. Very excited for it. See you guys soon.